let's get started. So tonight, you're going to hear from a phenomenal panel of women in STEM. Um, we come from various backgrounds. We've all studied very different uh, STEM careers that we're going to share with you tonight. And we live all across the U.S. The one thing that we have in common is that we are all AAAS If Then Ambassadors. And AAAS stands for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, what they did last year is they chose 125 women from across the country from very different fields and backgrounds. Um, and we have all been chosen to be role models to young girls and boys across the country. Um, and we do a variety of events outside of just visiting classrooms and doing the outreach that we each individually love to do. Collectively, we also uh, partake in a lot of different things. You may recognize some of these women from the CBS morning show, Mission Unstoppable. Um, we are also part of the If Then collection, which is the largest free digital library of pictures and videos of women in STEM. So you may see some of us in classrooms and museums across the country. Um, and uh, really ex the most exciting thing I think is that we all have life-sized 3D printed statues of ourselves and we will all be featured in the largest exhibit of female statues in one place at one time ever in the world scheduled for this summer in Dallas, Texas. And how amazing that all of the women featured are women in STEM to really be able to show the community, the public, that women absolutely can STEM and be very successful in STEM and STEM has a place for women. So with all of that, let me introduce to you today's panelists. Um, so I am Paula Garcia Todd. I'm a pharmaceutical scientist. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in chemical engineering. I've been working in pharmaceuticals for 18 years and I love it. Um, you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Watch Me STEM. Please feel free to message me for any questions that you may have. Hi everyone, I'm Sam Wins. I'm a conservation biologist with the National Park Service in San Diego, California at the beautiful Cabrillo National Monument. Um, I get to both do science and then communicate that science to the public. It's really a dream of mine. It's the best of both worlds. And you can find me on Instagram at Steamboss Sammy. Hi, I'm Erica Kurt and I lead the Small World Initiative. So I work with thousands of students all over the world uh, to hunt for new drugs to treat infectious diseases that are found in soil bacteria. Uh, I have two law degrees and I am based in Connecticut. And you can find me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Erica Kurt. Awesome. Um, so I'm Bea Mendez Gandica, but you can call me Bea. I'm an engineering program manager at Microsoft. I work in Microsoft Cloud called Azure. And I'm also on the side, I run a nonprofit where we teach students like yourself how to code. And the, I'm available at Bea Gandica in any social media. And I'm Olivia Castellini. I am a senior exhibit developer at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Uh, my background, I have a PhD in physics, but I also have a degree in music. And my job is amazing because I get to tell really cool stories about science. Um, so I love all kinds of science, obviously physics, because I studied it. Um, but I get to poke my nose in everybody else's labs, figure out what's really cool about what they're doing, and then tell the world about it through museum exhibits. So you can find me on social at Dr. Olivia C. Hi, everyone. My name is Gracie Ermey, and I am a software engineer, which means that I write code. And uh, I work at a company called Vulcan in Seattle, Washington, where I'm building technology to help support wildlife conservation. So kind of a connection of two worlds that I didn't know existed until I got this job. So that's been very fun. Um, and my background is in computer science. So I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in computer science. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Gracie Ermey. Everyone, thanks for being here. I'm Dr. Rhonda Ham, and I am in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I am a entomologist and an educator. 
Um, you're going to find out what an entomologist is in just a minute. So I'm actually going to make you wonder what an entomologist studies. So it's a type of uh, scientist that studies a particular kind of animal. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and you'll find out in just a minute what that means. So uh, my degree, I have a bachelor's degree in agricultural education. So I was a high school teacher before I went to graduate school and I have a master's and a PhD in entomology. And I work at Corteva AgriScience uh, as our global um, academic relations leader. Awesome. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Megan Lewis. I work at Corteva AgriScience as a global field innovation lead. My master's and PhD is in plant breeding and genetics. So the creator of that fun seed that comes in a bag that farmers plant to feed the growing population. And <clears throat> it's been a journey. So now going from plant genetics to breeding, I now lead drones and agriculture robots and sensors and looking at agriculture fields in a different view. So super excited to be here. You can check me out at, at Dr. Megan on Instagram. And hi, everyone. My name is um, Dr. Erica Hamden. I'm a professor of astrophysics at the University of Arizona, and I build telescopes for a living, mostly space and sometimes on giant stratospheric balloons. Um, I am super excited to talk to all of you today um, about space and science and, and be here with all these amazing women. And you can find me on the internet at erica.hamden on Instagram and Twitter. Awesome. I hope you were all paying attention because there will be questions here about some of our panelists. So with that, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to play a game a little bit like Jeopardy. Um, we're going to pose some questions and we're going to ask you to put into the chat box what you think the answer is. And then we're going to give you the answer and tell you a little bit more about it. So we're hoping that this keeps it interactive and you can play along and learn some fun things tonight with us. These are our categories. We're going to talk about STEM fields, diversity in STEM, breaking stereotypes, did you know, and STEM facts. So with that, let's get this game started. So our very first question is, this type of scientist studies insects. Is it an entomologist, an immunologist, or an astronomer? I'll give you five seconds to put in your answer. And the answer is, Yay, so you actually asked the question before we even got to the slide. So thank you for that. You were actually practicing being a scientist before we even got started. So kudos to you. I am an entomologist and an entomologist studies insects. So these are some pictures of me um, with the one on the very far, I guess it's the left side for you, um, is actually an arachnid. So arachnids and insects vary slightly. So an arachnid has eight legs. An insect has six, they're kind of like cousins. So they're not actually related directly to each other. Um, and then the two white bars, those are actually a bunch of flies. I studied flies, house flies for um, my graduate degree or my PhD. The center picture is me actually working in the field. I'm actually putting insects into that corn plant and then looking to see how much damage that insect can do to that corn. And then on the other side, one of the things that I absolutely love doing is sharing the fun and exciting creatures that I have access to with people like you. So what I have in my hand there is called a vinegaroon. So that is a whip scorpion. So um, I challenge you to look up a little bit about what a whip scorpion is and does after we're done tonight. Cool, so awesome. Thank you for that, Rhonda. Amazing, okay. Here's the next question. This type of scientist studies life at every level from the microscopic to the biosphere. Is it a, a her herpetologist, a biologist, or an environmental scientist? I'll give you five seconds. And the answer is... Hi, everyone. The answer is... Biologist, because bio means life. 
So for instance, if you're reading a biography about someone, you're reading about their life. And if you're a scientist that studies life, you are a biologist. And, and biologists study all of life from the molecules and cells that make up living things, which would be molecular or cellular biology, to the DNA of different species, like geneticists study, to the human body and medicine, like epidemiologists and medical doctors study, to plants, which you'd have a botanist studying, animals, ecosystems, and even the biosphere or the entire planet. So there are many types of biologists who specialize in those different areas of life. And I happen to be someone called a conservation biologist, which means not only do I study life to understand it better, but I'm also concerned with preserving and protecting that life. I need to know all I can about the life cycles and the lifestyles of different species so that I can figure out what's threatening those species in order to stop those threats. And you can see me studying some of that life at my National Park Cabrillo National Monument. I study our herpetofauna, which means reptiles and amphibians. You can see over here with my, my friend, the California king snake. Right here, I'm setting up bat sensors because we study our bat population at Cabrillo. And here I am even in our rocky intertidal ecosystem in our tide pools, studying a really cool marine snail called an owl limpet. Awesome, thank you, Sam. I hate snakes, that scares me so much. You post so many pictures of yourselves with snakes. <laughs> I'm gonna right. your mind someday, Paula. Challenge <laughs> <laughs> accepted. All right, next question. This type of scientist studies the universe outside of our solar system. Is it a geologist, an astrophysicist, or an oceanographer? Give you five seconds. And the answer is... It's B, astrophysicist, um, which is... I'm pleased to say is my job because I think it's the, one of the best jobs that you can have. Um, so astrophysicists, we use uh, all sorts of telescopes to look at the universe, basically everything outside of the solar system, which covers a very large area because space is giant. Um, so I use some telescopes on the ground. So this picture is me um, at one of the telescopes that we have here at the University of Arizona. We use this one for public observing because um, it's in the middle of town and it's it's pretty busy. Um, but if you're ever out here in the after times, you can come and look through the telescope and see some planets and stars. Um, but I also use things like the Hubble Space Telescope, which is that space telescope that's pictured in the middle. And you can use these telescopes to look at all sorts of really cool things. So we can look at new stars that are forming. We can look at um, really like interesting new planetary systems that are forming. So those pictures on the right are some artist representations of what we think a forming solar system looks like and then maybe a planet around another star. Um, so you can sort of cover this like huge range of looking at galaxies and like the biggest stuff in the universe all the way down to trying to find a planet just like Earth around a different star. So it covers this huge area of space, also like huge scales from like really giant things all the way down to very small things. And it actually connects now in studying those extrasolar planets, it connects with lots of other science fields on earth because you know you have to talk to um, people who study earth science to understand atmospheres of the planets and biologists to understand whether those planets might have life. So it's starting to get um, really interesting. I mean, it's always been interesting, but there's just so much to explore and understand. Awesome, thank you. All right, this might be a tricky one. Let's see if you can get it. Uh, true or false, all scientists do research in a lab. True or false? And the answer is? You guys are pretty hard to fool. Um, no, we don't all do research in a lab. Um, so, my job as an exhibit developer, you know, I started out and I went to school and I did research in a lab, but now my research is more about how people learn science and how to engage them in that. Um, so I am learning new science all of the time and that's part of what I love. Um, so my job as an exhibit developer, you're looking at sort of a range of pictures of the 
million different hats that I wear in the work that I do. So in the upper right corner, you see at the Science Storms exhibit at the Museum of Science and Industry here in Chicago. And my job is helping make those kind of things. So I get to go out and meet all kinds of cool people like the women featured in this panel. And I hear what they're passionate about and what they're researching and the amazing discoveries um, that they, they have. Um, and then I think of what people like you would find interesting to do and what you could do to actually get your hands on an experiment and do part of that science for yourself within the museum. So as part of that, um, I get to do all kinds of crazy, exciting things. So there's sort of dreaming up over on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see a little sketch um, that's from an exhibit um, concept on nanotechnology. So we start to sketch out different ideas. Once we learn the science and choose the stories we want to tell, we start to sketch out like what might people get to do in the exhibit. Um, I then on the bottom left hand corner, um, I actually go down on the floor and this is part of where the research of my job comes in because I take prototypes. I mock up exhibit elements and I'll go down and I'll talk to people down on the museum floor and see what interests them, what's confusing, what's exciting, um, and help use that to sort of improve our exhibit ideas. And then in the center, some pictures from, uh, from uh, production, um, actually making the exhibit itself. I've been involved, there's some pictures of me there um, out doing media production for the Science Storms exhibit. I got to do everything from blow up a car at explosives camp to tornado chasing, um, which was really cool. Um, and then sometimes like at the bottom of the screen, um, it's working with students or working with uh, media production companies um, to continue to tell stories, um, both um, real and in fiction um, about science to help get the word out about the cool work that's being done. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, we are on to our next category, which is the did you know category. So I hope you're paying attention as our panelists were introducing themselves. All right, time to start guessing. So this panelist was a camp counselor every summer during college. Who do you think it is? And the answer is? Me, it was me, Gracie. Um, yeah, being a camp counselor was one of the best jobs I've ever had. And even though it doesn't seem super directly related to being a software engineer now and the coding work that I do, I think it's just so important to remember that everything you do throughout your life, um, all the different things you're interested in are helping you to learn different skills that you're gonna use no matter what career you decide to do in the future. So um, I learned so much as a camp counselor and had such a fun time being a camp counselor. Um, and I use that stuff every day, even in my coding work, so. Awesome, thank you, Gracie. All right, on to our next question. This panelist wanted to own an ice cream shop. Who do you think it is? And the answer is, I still have that dream. Hopefully it would happen at some point. Uh, but yes, I, I, I had a love for computers since I was growing up and video games and everything. But I still love ice cream so, but so, but so much that every time we teach, us, uh, we teach kids, like we ask, like, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? And we have words to see if it's a fruity flavor of the class or if it's more on the chocolate or just like flower flavors or strange flavors. Um, so, yeah, I love ice cream too much. I think, and, and, and I'll tell you why I wanted to have an ice cream shop, because in my head, I thought that if I have an ice cream shop, I could have every flavor every day. So that's how much I like ice cream. I love it. I love it. I think I fall in a similar category. I'm not There's actually lie. some really great physics and chemistry and all of that too. So it's still a science career. So there you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Uh, next question. This panelist was so afraid of failure that she almost didn't pursue her greatest passion. Who do you think it is? And the answer is... Surprise, surprise, it's me. Um, 
we can't see your hands right now, but I bet you if I was to ask, let me see a show, show of hands, who is afraid of failure, that pretty much everybody would raise their hand. Am I right, ladies? Um, well, me too. In fact, I was so afraid of failing that I almost didn't become a scientist. So science didn't come easy to me. Um, while I loved doing it, I had to work very hard at it to succeed. And there were times that I struggled and times that I failed. And that fear of failure led me to question whether I could even become a scientist in the first place. And once I did, whether I belonged in that space. And I almost let fear dictate my life. I almost let it prevent me from doing the thing I love most, which is studying and protecting nature. But I'm here to say that it's okay to be afraid. Um, it's what you do with that fear that matters. If you push through that fear, believe you can do it and find a support system that believes in you too, um, then you can accomplish almost anything. And you know what? You are going to fail because guess what? That's science. And um, we're asking questions in science and trying to find the answers that no one has ever found before. Um, but tell yourself that failure is actually an important part of the process. It's an important part of learning and an important part of improving. And without failure, we'd never have all of the scientific breakthroughs that we have today. So if you feel fear sometimes like I do, tell yourself that you can do it, believe that you can do it and embrace all your failures along the way. Those failures are ultimately what will turn you into a success. Don't let fear prevent you from following your passion and doing what matters, friends. Thank you so much, Sam. I think a lot of us can absolutely relate to that. All right, next question. This panelist co-founded a STEM camp. Who do you think it is? And the answer is, Da, 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 Lewis Pathfinder STEM Camp, woo! Yeah, so this was a dream of mine for quite a while, and I'll try to make my answer quick, Paula, but I think that this is really important. And so one story that not many know is that my dad was a world-known science teacher, and he got the top science teacher of the world back in 2005. And he was my first mentor, him and my mom, education was important, and he just really instilled a love for science. I remember vividly, three years old, doing my first science experiment in his science lab with all the other kids and the students that he mentored. Well, unfortunately, uh, life is short. So this is my message to all of you. Make every moment count. Make every interaction count. My dad passed away unexpectedly from a brain aneurysm in 2013. And I, I tried to do too much. I think a lot of the ladies on the panel can relate. I try to try to make half the impact that my dad did in the STEM outreach world. So I was on national committees, living in the airplane, and I'm a mom and a leader. And so it just got to be so much where uh, I sat down and I remember this night, I looked at my husband and I said, I know what I wanna do. I wanna fund a STEM camp. And my husband goes, okay, go to sleep. You're fine, we'll chat about it in the morning. But anyways, it turned to a reality. So my dream of bringing science into lives for children, just like my dad came true back in 2019. So my husband, he smiled, we went on a journey, we funded a STEM camp, and now we can bring STEM to all ages, all diversity, and now we're going virtual, which means that we can go outside Iowa. And it's truly fun. We try to help students like you Find your path one activity at a time. And that's our slogan. So thank you, Paula. Awesome, Megan. You are making such an impact and you know it. It's amazing. All right, here we go. Next question. This panelist wanted to be an astronaut when she was younger and has applied three times so far. And I want to repeat that. She has applied three times so far. Talk about persistence. Who do you think it is? And the answer is? Be the astrophysicist. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to be an astronaut since I was like six years old or seven years old when I first learned about space. And I'm an astrophysicist because I think space is really cool and I would like to go there. But if I can't go there, it's also fun to like build telescopes that get to go to space. 
Um, but I um, have applied three times. I have not been selected. I'm going to keep going until I'm like too old to climb into the spaceship. <laughs> Um, but I visited like some of these pictures are me visiting like Kennedy Space Center um, or Johnson Space Center where the, the Saturn V is and there's a mock shuttle um, that you can like sit and pretend to fly in at um, Kennedy Space Center, which is where that upper right picture is from. Um, in order to be an astronaut, aside from being willing to apply a bunch of times, you have to be in pretty good shape and you the, the actual like technical requirements are pretty limited. You have to have a, um, it used to be just a bachelor's degree, now a master's degree in a, in a STEM field um, or be like a, a medical doctor um, and have like pretty good vision. And that, that's like basically it. But the actual requirements are they want you to know how to do all sorts of things to be like really excellent in your field, but also like know how to fly a plane and know how to scuba dive and know how to survive in the wilderness or like be really great to be stuck in like a tiny room with for six months at a time. So people who are like into long distance camping or who have spent like time in Antarctica are um, all really good candidates. So in, I don't have a ton of free time, but I am learning how to fly a plane. Um, just for now, it's like a little single engine Cessna, but it is extremely fun. So I like love doing it. Um, and yeah, the, you know, I know that the odds are low for getting selected. It's like super duper hard because so many people apply and there are so many people that would be really good at it. Um, but I just have to keep trying and see what happens. Love it. Thank you, Erica. That's amazing. All right. We are on to our next category which is stem facts here we go about one trillion human cells make up each human how many bacterial cells are in and on each human is it 10 million one trillion or 10 trillion and the answer is the answer is 10 trillion. So we actually have 10 times more bacterial cells uh, in and on us than human cells. And I always like to share this with people because I think bacteria gets a bad rap, but most bacteria, you know, that live in and on us, they, they help us or we don't yet understand what it does. So it's a very limited um, number of bacterial species that are actually uh, harming us. Uh, so I think that's really important to share. And it also helps us think about, you know, what might bacteria be doing? Is it helping us digest our food? Does it have a role to play perhaps in our personality? Um, and so it's, it's really interesting to think about, you know, what that impact might be and how we live in a nice um, kind of symbiotic relationship <laughs> with this bacteria that's in and on us. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. All right, here's our ne next STEM fact. The World Wide Web, also known as the internet, was born the same year as this panelist. Who do you think it is? And the answer is... C, it's me, Gracie, <laughs> yeah. So it's not um, maybe, or maybe it is older than you think, or maybe younger, I'm not sure. But um, I was surprised that, uh, yeah, that it was the same age as me. <laughs> I'm going to say thank you to all of you who thought I was that young. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Gracie. All right. All right. This is a tricky one. There have been blank mass extinction events. And by a mass extinction, we're talking about when many species go extinct over a short period of time in Earth's history. So how many times do you think that has happened? Is it one, is it three, or is it five times? And the answer is? Well, I'm sorry to say the answer is five times. Um, and we know about these mass extinction events from the fossil record, right? So the largest event was the Permian extinction um, with over 95% of marine, that means sea creatures, 
and 70% of terrestrial species, that means land creatures, going extinct in a short period of time. And these were likely caused by volcanic eruptions in uh, Siberia. But the most famous mass extinction event, I bet you're thinking of it right now, we've all seen Jurassic Park, right? <laughs> is the Cretaceous or KT. And this is the one where the dinosaurs or most of them went extinct. But you might be wondering, why do we have a picture of animals that are alive right now next to these mass extinction events? Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, um, but we are actually going through another mass extinction event right now. This one, however, is not caused by a meteor or volcanic eruptions. This one is caused pretty much entirely by humans through our actions like destroying habitat, the places where plants and animals live, right? Climate change, pollution, introducing invasive species or species of plants and animals that don't belong in an area that then go out and invade. And it's the accelerating the transportation of diseases. Um, so that's why I became a conservation biologist. It's a really big, sad problem that affects not only plants and animals, but guess what? humans too. Losing species to extinction means that we lose resources like food, medicines, clean air, clean water, and so much more. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom, friends. If this is a problem you want to solve, guess what? STEM is the answer. There are many different STEM fields and STEM professionals that are doing their part to solve this global issue right now, like conservation biology, like climatology, environmental engineering, and so much more. Um, and maybe that's something that you'll want to pursue as you get older. And if you do, or if you have any questions about this, I'd be happy to field them in the Q&A. Awesome. Thanks so much. Okay. Now we're on to our next category, which is diversity in STEM. This percentage of college students intending to major in STEM fields do not complete a STEM degree. Do you think it's 10%? Do you think it's 25%? Do you think it's 60%? And the answer is... So more than 60% of students who start off in college and they, you know, they think they're going to major in a STEM field, they actually end up switching majors and go into another field. And I actually was one of those students who, uh, where, you know, this happened to me as well. And one of the key reasons is because uh, introductory classes, they're taught with a lot of memorization and regurgitation and not a lot of um, doing what you would do in the real world. So not a lot of connection to, um, to real problems that you could solve with the, with the, the STEM subjects that you're learning. And, uh, and this is the reason why I actually um, do what I do now. So I now get to work on solving this educational challenge uh, by introducing discovery-based education uh, at the college and high school level. And so we actually have students doing the real work that you would do if you were at Pfizer doing some natural products drug discovery. So natural products drug discovery means that you're finding drugs that are naturally in the world around you from things like soil or from plants or animals or, uh, or even uh, insects. And, uh, and so students actually go and they collect a soil sample and they grow out the bacteria and they test to see if it has any interesting properties that could help humans. And, uh, and it's a really great way of making STEM both exciting and, um, and showing what you could do with uh, that type of expertise in the real world. Awesome. Thanks so much, Erica. Okay, here's your next question. According to the 2017 USDA Census of Agriculture, this percentage of US farmers are women. Do you think it's 10%, 36%, or 62%? And the answer is... 
It's B, 36%. So there are 36% of women farmers. And so that number actually um, is growing, especially if you go outside of the United States. So internationally, there are a lot of women farmers. In fact, majority of, of small farmers in developing countries are women. So they're actually the ones that are tending the crops and growing the food for their families. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. Okay, your next question is, the percentage of women in engineering who are identify themselves as Latinx or Hispanic is, is it 2%, 15%, or 30%? And the answer is? 2%. Um, so that's actually way better than it used to be a year or two ago, which was less than 1%. Uh, so the numbers are increasing. Um, the first picture, uh, it's in there where I was teaching uh, girls in Florida uh, about what computer science is, what, what is it like to code, what type of careers you can have. And then the second picture where you see a bunch of hands up, um, that is uh, Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper uh, is one of the conference that you, if you are into computer science or coding or technology in general, maybe you don't want to code, but you're still fascinated by technology. I highly recommend it. High schoolers get to go and attend as well. Uh, and so in there, there is multiple chapters within Grace Hopper. And this one is specific to Latinas uh, or Hispanic Latino women. Uh, that are part of there. And so it's always a good experience to see that we started from a group of like 60, the first year that we had this at Grace Hopper uh, and last event that we had in person, we were over 250. So the number is increasing. People from all over the world do get to come uh, to this conference, but we need some help, um, you know, in terms of like, how can we reach out to more? So part of the work that I do specifically is how can we help underrepresented, not just Latinas, but underrepresented in general, how can we bring more of those to tech? Awesome. Thanks, Bea. Okay, this is our bonus question, diversity in STEM. Studies show that companies with greater diversity tend to be more profitable and innovative. True or false? And the answer is true. That is absolutely true. So McKinsey just recently released a new study further emphasizing that the more diverse a company is, the more likely it is to see higher profits, um, as well as more innovation, more patents, more, um, more new products. And the reason for that is that the more diverse your workforce is, the more different perspectives that you're bringing into play. And when you have a lot of different perspectives sitting around a table looking at a problem, you're more likely to find more interesting solutions because everyone is bringing something new and interesting to the table. So diversity absolutely matters. And so these are the things that we need to consider. If you don't necessarily see someone who looks like you in a field that you want to be in, it's not a bad thing. You're bringing that diversity. You're bringing a different perspective. So never let that be a reason to stop you from pursuing something that you want to do. All right. Now we are on to, I think this is our last category, breaking stereotypes. Here we go. This panelist was in a performing arts centered dance performance while in graduate school. Who do you think it is? And the answer is me. So yeah, I was, uh, I started dancing when I was three years old. And so I have done tap, I have done ballet. And what I did here in this particular performance, performance I was a swing dancer. So you can awesome. do swing and dance at the same time. <laughs> yes, you can be a scientist and do a lot of things at the same time. Let's be clear. All right, next question. This panelist has a uh, second degree black belt in martial arts and has completed seven marathons. And note to self, I never want to upset this person ever in my life. Who do you think it is? And the answer is? 
I promise you're all good, Paula. <laughs> You'll be fine. Uh, it's me. Um, so I have all kinds of crazy interests. I'm a runner. I'm a triathlete. Um, there's a couple pictures of me from various things. I think one of my favorite marathons um, in the lower right corner, I finished the Easter Island Marathon. Um, yeah, which was, which was fun. It sounded like fun to say I ran up one side of a volcano and back down twice. Um, so that was cool. And I got to check a bucket list item off of, off of the list. Um, and also with martial arts, uh, you know, in, I started studying that in grad school, actually. Um, so there's all, all of the different interests that you have. I think I, I really, you know, something Gracie said earlier, um, pursue everything that's of interest to you because you never know what's going to be useful. I think a little aspect of all of my interests between my background in music and theater. I also, I played violin since I was five and went to performing arts school as a kid. Um, but all of like the determination and all of the stuff to do seven marathons and train for black belts, all of that goes into all of my science training. It's that same sort of grit and determination um, that is involved in doing science. So do everything that's interesting to you. You never know what you're gonna, where, where you're gonna end up. Thank you, Olivia. Okay, our next question is, this panelist composes piano music. Who do you think it is? And the answer is da, 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 Dr. Megan. So I actually triple majored in my undergrad in piano performance, opera performance, and plant science. And so music's always been a part of who I am. A fun fact with music is that I was asked to sing at my brother's wedding and I couldn't find the right piece. So that was just another reason for me to buckle down and just compose music, piano chords to um the lyrics and it was awesome so i love music i'm a mom i'm a global leader i'm a scientist but i'm also a musician and a wife and a sister and an aunt so you can be many things and just go get it awesome thank you megan okay i think this is our last question for today this panelist learn how to code in university who do you think it is And the answer is, this is a tricky one. <laughs> it's me and Bea. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, neither of us learned how to code before we got to college. I didn't even know what, I did not know what computer science was until I got to college. Yeah. So if you, are, if you're coding already, or if there's a program that you are joining and you code already, you'll be ahead of the curve, you know, because like Gracie and I learned uh, when we were older. So now you'll be like even stronger, uh, you know, coders. So that's, that's something that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So now it's your turn. And I know we're a little short on time, but we're willing to stay a little longer to answer questions. I want you to think about any questions that you may have for our panelists. Please put them in the Q&A box for us to be able to answer them. And in the meantime, as I'm opening up and reading some of the questions that are coming in, I'm going to ask the panelists if anyone has any pieces of advice for they would like to give to young girls that are interested in pursuing STEM. Don't be afraid, go do it. Yeah, I also have that go do it advice. Uh, make sure that you're you know, taking chances on opportunities that interest you. Um, and, and that's one of the things I did. I applied for a job where I couldn't check off all of the um, qualifications that they were looking for. And, um, and I found out that a lot of girls don't apply under those circumstances, but guys do. So make sure that you know, you're taking a chance. I ended up getting that job. So perhaps you're exactly what they're looking for, even if you know, they haven't described you perfectly in their, their job announcement. So take those chances. I would add to that as well. I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat around like where to go to school, how long were you in school? Um, and just know that there, there's a lot of misconceptions about what it takes to be a scientist and there isn't one right path, you know, and sort of along that lines of like, follow, follow your passions and do all of the things. 
Um, you know, you don't have to go all the way through school and get a PhD in order to do work. Like you could be a scientist and get involved, not have any degrees and get involved in citizen science programs, for example, or some of the other amazing opportunities that uh, the other panelists have mentioned. Um, so you, you really, there's no just one right way to do it. You know, the, the STEM fields need everybody and we need that diversity of experience and thinking and um, all of that um, means there's, there's room for everybody and there's, there's a way into it um, for everyone to follow their own unique path. And try new things because sometimes science is scary. I actually was terrified of insects as a kid. So I didn't know that I would study them someday because I was too afraid to even get close to them. And so um, keep an open mind and try some things that might even be scary to you. And the one last piece of advice I just wanted to add is the best piece of advice I ever got in my life, and that is to be yourself, right? If you are yourself, your authentic self, following your passions and the things that interest you, um, amazing things will come to you in your life. And you can build amazing things for yourself in your life, but not if you're trying to be anybody else or trying to please other people all the time, right? Like just be yourself. We need your unique voice at the scientific table. Yeah, and the last thing I, I, what I wanted to add is just raise your hand. You know, if you have questions and you don't understand something, um, just speak it out loud. Um, because for example, when in my coding classes, uh, I didn't get it at first, right? It, it was at the third time or sometimes at the fourth time that I would get it. So raise your hand and say, hey, I, I'm not understanding. Can you teach me in another way? Can you split me in another way? You have YouTube, you have Google, uh, a lot of things that you can go and, and look on your own, but, it, but do raise your hand for, for opportunities and when you don't understand. There is no stupid questions. There are stupid answers, but not stupid questions. So make sure that you raise your hand. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to answer. I'm going to start asking some of these questions that have come through. Um, in the meantime, what I'm going to do before I get to those questions, I just want to pop up this slide again if it responds to me. Okay. Um, I'm just going to leave this up here in case you need the name of someone that you want to ask a question to in particular. Um, if you want to write down how to reach any of these scientists that you've heard from today, just going to leave this up here. The other quick thing I want to mention is we do have some prizes. Um, if you'd like to enter for the potential to win a prize, we need you to go to the Atlanta Science Festival uh, website and hit on testimonials. And we'd love for you to share what inspired you out of today's session. And please, please, please include that hashtag STEM women. So we're able to filter and find your responses. Okay. We're going to have five prizes that we're going to give away to anyone who participates in that. Okay. So with that, let me start uh, asking some questions of the panelists. Um, I think this is a really good question. I'm going to, um, I think, uh, I'm going to go to Erica K, Erica Kurt. Um, when did you find your passion that you wanted to be a scientist? So actually, when I was a little kid, my dad used to read me Science Magazine and the New England Journal of Medicine as my bedtime stories. And, uh, and I really dreamed about um, going into this field and being a scientist and doing cool things. And I had a really awesome microscope that had a projector on the end. And I had my own experiments when I was, that was from Toys R Us. It's a better microscope than, than, <laughs> than I can find sometimes now. Um, and so it was only later that I was actually discouraged from going into STEM, which I think happens to a lot of girls, uh, that leaky pipeline. So every year, more and more girls, even if they start out with the same abilities as boys, um, they're kind of discouraged from pursuing those fields uh, and they might think that it's too hard or they don't see how they can use it to do something that they're interested in. Uh, and so it was only later that I kind of figured out how uh, to make that work. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone want to add anything else to that? All right, cool. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to ask the other Erica, Erica H. Did you ever face times when you were unsure that you could make it in your career? Um, yeah, actually, I so I've liked space since I was a little kid and I um, 
was really good at math and science and I really liked it in high school. And so for college, I went to MIT and I was really excited because everyone was gonna be like nerdy and into science like me. And I like thought it was gonna be super awesome and it was not. And I dropped out after Thanksgiving. It was the Monday after Thanksgiving. My parents picked me up and took me home. And it was like hugely disappointing. I didn't, I didn't like leave with the idea that I was gonna come back. I just like left and dropped out and I like was pretty depressed about it. And um, I had to like really figure out what I wanted to do and like, why that had happened and there was like I went to a bunch of therapy and I I like started taking classes at the local university in my town just to like have something to do and I worked at Borders and I really had to like figure out like well I wanted to go back to college I wanted to keep doing it and then when I went back to college I like didn't take any science classes for the first semester and I realized that I really missed it and like it was something that I actually did like and it was just a bad experience in one place that didn't mean that it wasn't right for me and I've tried to keep that in mind when I make decisions that like there are other decision points like about going to grad school after college and I decided I would work as a chef for a year because I also really liked food and I wanted to like see what the other path would be. So I took the time to do that and then went to grad school because of when I was working as a chef I felt like oh I really missed learning and and the challenge of of research and doing new things and so that helped me to make sure that I was making the right choice but the whole time at every choice, I'm like, well, should I do this or should I do something else? And and you just have to like be kind of honest with yourself about what you want and like what really gets you up in the morning. And so I'm glad that I'm doing this because I love it and every day I'm excited to, to work at it. Um, but it's definitely been a, like, you can look at all of us and think like, oh, they must've had the straight and easy path to where they are. And that's never, ever, ever true. Thank you so much for sharing that. We did have a follow-up question that came in as, uh, as you were talking, someone asked, what didn't you like about MIT? Oh, um, it was a lot of things. I mean, it was the fall of 2001. So like the world was a bad in a different way than it is now. <laughs> um, and I was, I had a very sheltered childhood. So I like, wasn't used to be on my own and like having to make decisions about things. And like, I wanted to, you know, I, I felt like, I didn't really know how to like do stuff on my own and and at MIT I you know there were a lot of really interesting smart creative people but a lot of them at that time anyway they were gonna um go into management and then become bankers and make a lot of money and a lot of them did do that and they helped like crash the world economy in 2008 with like the financialization of everything this is <laughs> getting to be a lot but I just like, I didn't really find people who were there because they were super excited about science. And I started having basically like intense anxiety that, oh, I don't like my classes. I don't like the, you know, I see these other people who don't like what they're doing. Am I gonna not like what I'm doing? And then I'm gonna get a job that I don't like and I'm gonna have a life that I don't like. And it just kind of like spiraled from there. And it was really hard to get out of that. I had to like remove myself from the situation basically to, to, to address all of that and then, know be a little more secure in myself that like okay well what I want to do is worthwhile even if nobody else around me thinks that it is like all of them are wrong and stupid and I am right and then I basically had to like figure all of that out it was really a challenge nice thank you for sharing that um okay Rhonda is STEM hard yeah so STEM can be hard um sometimes it takes work so I won't say it's hard. I will say that it, it takes work. Um, so, you know, some things for some people, they come really easy. Other people, you know, you have to work at it. Um, and so I think STEM takes work um, and it takes work on all of our behalves to learn the field, to study, to make sure that, you know, we know what we need to know for our jobs, right? Um, and I, I don't think that that ever really changes. So I think anybody that's in a job, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily that it's hard. It might be hard and you might need help um, for some things, but I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as hard. I would characterize it as you have to work for it and work at it sometimes. And sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's fun. And that's what makes it exciting is that it's all of those things. Awesome, thank you. Um, Sam, I think this is a good question for you. 
where do you need to go to college if you want to study how to help the environment? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, there's actually a lot of programs at almost every college now um, that have to do with helping the environment. So there's tons of different programs, tons of different fields that you can enter into. So you could go into any of the biological sciences, like me as a conservation biologist, um, and that would include um, biology, ecology, um, environmental science. Um, you could even become an environmental engineer. So that's an engineer who builds things that are better for the environment. You could be a sustainability major, which is like, how can we live on planet earth um, with nature in a more sustainable uh, fashion, right? So there's lots of different fields of study that you can go into that, that will ultimately help the environment. Um, and I would just look at any colleges that you're interested in attending, just look up those different departments in that college and then go take a tour of those different departments to find out if it's right for you. Awesome. All right, Megan, I have a question for you. Have you ever gotten hated on for being in STEM? Of course I'd get that one, Paula, because I forgot the shirt, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's a great question. And so I'm going to answer this with positivity. Um, that's actually a word that I don't let my kiddos say at home, uh, just because I make them think of positive solution-centric words. But here we go. So for that, yes. In a nutshell, yes. I have, I've been called a science nerd. I've been called a geek. I've been called many other names, but I, I wore it with honor. I took it as a badge, you know, and I put it on like the Girl Scouts get badges for their activities. And I actually use those names as a badge on my jacket because I was proud and, and I strive to be a strong role model for my girls, but also kiddos across the world to say, follow your dreams, do what you want. And the biggest slogan that I have is be you. I recently did a podcast and the podcast director took my slogan and put it on a t-shirt. So if you need extra inspiration, it's be kind, be great, be you. And just a reminder that yes, overall I did, but I, I'm a positive person and an extrovert, if you can't tell. And I always try to spin things and I try to teach my girls to do the same because the journey's not easy. You're gonna hit lots of bumps. I tell my kiddos and even all the mentees that I chatted with today, that it's not all rainbows, sprinkles, gumdrops, that there are detours, construction zones. And so I challenge everyone to embrace those construction zones, embrace those detours, get better, but most importantly, be you. So if you get called a science nerd, Bill, put it on a shirt. I have a little bracelet that somebody gave me on this call that I wear every single day as a reminder. My daughters love it too. And so Paula, that's what I would say for that question. That is an excellent answer. That's why I picked on you for that question. I knew you'd give an excellent answer. Um, Olivia, I have a question that I, I think it might be really good for you to answer since um, you've, you went on to graduate school. There's a question about, you know, how long have you been in school? So maybe it would be good to break out, you know, what it looks like to get a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD. Um, yeah, sometimes it feels like I've been in school since the dawn of time. Um, so, um, yeah, so my, my specific, uh, journey, I, I went through all the way up through high school and then I went straight on to undergraduate where I studied physics and music as a double major. And then directly from undergraduate, I went to graduate school and I chose a program that, um, it was called master's inclusive. So it was a PhD program and along the way I earned my master's degree. Um, so I went to grad school knowing that I was going for a PhD and I, and I wasn't just planning to stop at the master's degree level. Um, so all of that all together, um, you know, four years of college, um, I ended up being in grad school for five and a half years. Um, and that really varies a lot on the type of science that you study. Um, you know, so I have some, some folks who started um, at the same time as I did, who completed everything. I had about two years of coursework um, and then research started really in earnest after that. So, um, you know, I, it took me five and a half years from starting grad school to defending my PhD thesis. 
Um, and then some, some of the, the guys I, stud, I started with, they finished after three years. Um, they were doing more theoretical astrophysics. So a lot of sitting in front of a computer. Um, whereas I was in, um, I was over in the lab crying, trying to get carbon nanotubes to do the thing that I wanted to in the clean room and they weren't cooperating. Um, so it really can vary a lot. Um, so for me, it was nine and a half years uh, after high school. Um, and then another year of a postdoc before I um, found my job at the museum, which is its own fun, crazy story. Perfect. And Paula, I just wanted to add that, uh, I don't know about all the industries, but in tech, if you join a, a big company, they, they pay for your master's. Um, so it's, for example, if you can only afford undergrad, but then you join the tech world, um, you know, like I got my master's paid for, and I know people that are at Microsoft that are also doing PhDs. Um, so it might not be the entire tuition, but it's a big part um, that you can do as well if funds is something you're worried about. Yeah, that's a great addition. Thank you for that. Um, Gracie, I have a question for you. Is Paula, it a part? Yes. Sorry, we're, we're running up at uh, 7.38 PM. So maybe okay. one more question and then Perfect. we can wrap up. Great. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, Gracie, is it hard to code? You know, similar to what uh, Rhonda was saying, it was, it definitely just, it takes practice. Sometimes it can be, you can get stuck and it can be pretty frustrating while you're coding, but um, nobody, everybody, no matter how long you've been coding, runs into that kind of situation where you're just, you're feeling pretty stuck. And um, I definitely can have, frequently run into times when I'm like, man, am I like good enough at coding to like really do this? Like, can I figure this out? But I'm always able to figure it out, you know? So uh, you just got to keep practicing and then eventually you get more comfortable with coding and it's, uh, and it gets easier, you know, but it takes practice. And so if you're learning to code, remember that everyone has been in the position that you're in and everyone has struggled with learn learning to code at some point or another, if they are someone who codes. Um, and so you're not alone and just ask for help when you need it. And uh, Google is your friend. I feel like I'm a professional Googler. So I know how to Google things exactly <laughs> the way I need to, to find the answer. So um, there's nothing wrong with that either. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that. All right. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. If you enjoyed tonight's session, I urge you to come back on Saturday because we are doing another panel with completely different women, completely different backgrounds, completely different STEM fields, completely different questions. So if you had fun tonight and you want to learn even more, please, please come back on Saturday, 11 a.m. to meet these amazing ambassadors who will share their experiences with you as well. So with that, thank you to my fellow If Then Ambassadors for joining me tonight. Jordan, do you want to wrap things up? We're wrapping up. It's the end of the event. Thank you so much to all these amazing women STEM professionals and Paula Garcia Todd for hosting the event and putting this together and getting all these amazing brains in one place. So thank you all for being here. Have a great night. And we'll see you at the next Atlanta Science Festival event. Thank you.